Okay, while everybody's taking their seats, we're going to get started. Everybody comes to a meeting like this with certain objectives. Our objective to start out today is to really give you a little bit of insight into the how, the why, and by whom regenerative organic certification or the ROC standard was developed and how it's being governed. I assume all of you came with certain objectives as well. So this is a little bit participatory. First of all, we're going to have a panel conversation here where the panel is going to talk to you about those objectives I just mentioned. And then we're going to turn it over to you, so you have a role to play as well. Each of you should find on your seat a little card like this. Your role is to write a really well thought out and concise question on this card. And what are they going to do, Nicole? Pass them to the end of the aisle? or? Raise your hand up with your card and someone will come around and collect it. They will be analyzed and we will go through the, the questions and some of the questions will be answered here, particularly if there's multiples, we'll try to uh, choreograph those and, and answer them. But all the questions will be answered in a newsletter. So if your question isn't answered here, don't feel bad. We will get to that question and answer and, and make it happen. Let's talk a little bit about how we got to where we are and why we're using the words regenerative organic when we talk about the certification. First of all, it's really important to all of us in, 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 uh, at the ROC and at ROA that you all understand that we are forming a very tight link between regenerative and organic. We are not backing away from the organic. We are not saying there's anything wrong with the word organic. We fully support in practice and in principle all the standards that are centered around the concept and the word organic. Back in 1942, J.I. Rodale, whose picture you see there with the glass uh, looking at a uh, stalk of wheat, J.I. Rodale wrote some words on a blackboard. He said, healthy soil, healthy food, healthy people. What he was really telling us as farmers that our role and our job is not to produce food, it's not even to take care of the soil, it's to produce healthy people. The Rodale Institute has added the words planet behind that because we think it's really important that we also look at how the way we manage the soil has an impact on the planet. And that really launched us into the concepts of organic because G.I. Rodale focused his energy on that word. He popularized it through uh, publishing and printing and really made the organic industry what it is today. But by the late 1970s, as we were beginning to transition from a, uh, a kind of self-certified operation to a standard that was controlled by the federal government, Robert Rodale was very concerned about some of the some of the pillars, and we're going to talk about pillars here in a minute, some of the pillars that were being given up. And one of those pillars was the concept of continuous improvement. One of those pillars was the concept of soil health, animal welfare, and also uh, social justice. So a lot of people are beginning to use the, the term regenerative. This isn't the only room where we're going to be talking about regenerative. You hear the, I've heard the buzz on the floor yesterday as people talk about it. I've seen it in the popular press, uh, wherever you look and read. The problem is most people are not using the word organic with it. They recognize that they have to abandon the word sustainable because it doesn't mean anything. Or it means everything, depending on how you look at it. And it was really a marketing word, that, again, that Robert Rodale didn't like, because we're not interested in sustaining anything. We're interested in improving the system while we use it. And that's why he focused on the word regenerative. That's why we focus on the word regenerative. Because what we're really talking about is changing the way we look at, the way we envision and view the precious resources that we all use into the production systems of the ingredients, the commodities, the foods uh, that we all need for our, our health and for our businesses. We want to change how we use those resources. And then again, we're basing and we're going to go into these pillars in much greater depth as we go through the, the process today, this morning, and talk about the Regenerative Organic Alliance and the Regenerative Organic Certification Standard. And again, we've included not only the fact that we're certified organic, but we include the pillars of soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness, because those are very important not just to the consumers who buy the products that we all make and support, but it's also important to the planet that we do these things. 
In 2019, we made some precious steps forward by introducing our new executive director, um, who's going to come up and talk to us right now. So Elizabeth Whitlow, our new ED, welcome. Yeah, in 2018 we did not have an ED and now we do, so we're making great progress. She's going to walk you through and walk all of us through where we are today and how we got there. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to come here and learn more about what we're doing here with the ROA and with regenerative organic certification. Last year this was announced at Expo and I'm sure many of you thought it was a, just kind of a, a long shot, a pipe dream, that we could make this come together. But I can tell you that we have been working really hard in the last year and a lot of the details have come together. And in fact, every day I get up and I get to go work on these details and it is really the honor of my lifetime to get to do this work. It is seriously gotten, if you can see the map, we've got a really global reach. We've got pilots happening, 21 different pilots happening in nine countries. And so with that, we are looking at all kinds of different production systems. We're looking at annuals and perennials. We're looking at a diversity of from tropical to temperate zones. And we're also just looking in closely at different types of ownership schemes. So looking at smallholder co-op structures, as well as small diversified farms and then larger farms. And you can see some of the commodities here that we have that we're, we're representing in our pilot program. And today you're going to hear from a selection of these folks. We've got six of our pilot participants coming. We've got a very diverse farm here in, in California. We've got a dairy from northern coastal California. We've got grass-fed beef from the South Dakota area, perennial and medicinal herbs from the coastal hills of western Oregon, and agroforestry tropical fruits from Nicaragua. So what we're going to do is I'm going to invite each of these really amazing farmers to come up here and talk to you about the different pillars that they represent. Excuse me while I get this glass in. Um, so I, I'm going to start off with the soil pillar and, and we'll have two of the representatives come up and talk about their experience in meeting this framework criteria for rock standards from that context. We're going to start with soil, we're going to go into animal welfare, and then we'll finish with the social fairness. After we get through the, um, all of the different pillars, we have a, a really special treat for you, and then we're going to open it up for a Q&A. And as Jeff said, we're going to take all your questions, and whatever we can't get to today, we're going to send out in our newsletter. So if you're not signed up on our newsletter and you're interested in the follow-up on this, please go to our website and add your, add your name to our mailing list. And, um, and we will make sure that you get this. And now I'm going to turn to the soil pillar. And so I want to just call out a few of the things as you see here listed under our program, that we're building soil organic matter. And as Jeff said, our, our certification is based in organic, but we do have some special exceptions, such as a prohibition on soilless systems or hydroponics and all kinds of regenerative practices that need to be implemented. And so, this is really the number one priority in, in our program. And with that, I, I want to move into inviting our first panelist up. And he's sitting right down there, Safiano Moro. If you could please come up here and join me with my hat. And there we go. So, Safiano represents 650 growers in a grower group in Ghana. And they grow palm and they process palm oil there on site and they are implementing all kinds of amazing practices and I can't wait for you to hear more about his story. So thank you for coming and appreciate your efforts here. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much, yes. Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. Yeah. So I'm here to speak about the successes that uh, Serendi Palm has experienced in applying regenerative organic practices in all palm. My name is Safiano Moro, and I'm Managing Director of Serendi Palm. So Serendi Palm produces uh, organic and fair trade crude palm oil in Ghana. And we are certified by Ecoset, both organic and uh, fair trade. And we got recently also certified by 
natural land, on organic and natural land fair. Serendi Palm is owned by Dr. Bronis and it's managed by a local team with support from Dr. Bronis Special Operations Team. And we work with 650 smallholder farmers in Assume, which is in the eastern region of Ghana. Serendi Palm Company Limited has a palm oil mill which employs some 270 workers, most of whom are unskilled women. And we've been expanding our regenerative organic practices to include dynamic agroforestry, which is a multi-strata uh, planting system that involves different crops, well diversified, and then also uh, planted in such a manner that allows farmers to actually protect themselves, their soils, and then also uh, the farm workers they work with. To begin with, I would want to look at some of the practices that we've implemented over the years with our farmers. And we have an internal control system which employs uh, 10 people, so field, eight field officers and two managers and they work directly with the farmers on a day-to-day -day basis. And basically what they do is to recruit farmers and then also provide training, capacity building on best management practices. Most of uh, those practices would cover areas that protect the soil. And that is something that would continue to happen. And we continue to invest a lot in that because the farmers that we work with are smallholder farmers and they, most of them come into organic production mostly uh, focusing on the money side. So you have to invest in providing capacity building trainings for them to be able to start thinking about how do we produce uh, crops while protecting our soils. Apart from the capacity building side, Serendi Palm uh, is also looking at What's, what kind of uh, support systems can we put in place to help farmers? And cover crops is one of the ways we, 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 we think can help. And we've been helping farmers with uh, pereria seeds and then also showing them how to plant them in their fields. And that is largely to protect the soil against uh, erosion and then also to maintain water in the soil. It also suppresses weeds and generally uh, that's it's something most of our farmers are doing. Aside from that, there are palm fronts that after harvesting and pruning, our field officers train them to spread on bare lands and then also ac across the slope just to prevent soil erosion and then also to allow the fronts to decompose and add organic matter to the soil. That aside, uh, because we are processing the palm oil in an, organic matter, uh, in an organic manner in our own, at our own uh, facility. Some of the organic waste is also taken back to the field. So the empty fruit bunches, we send it back to the fields. And then also uh, uh, palm oil mill effluent is also sent back to the field as, uh, you know, mulching, to mulch the soil. And just uh, two, three years ago, we decided to also look at uh, other ways of intensifying our practices that would enrich the soil. And one of the ways was to look at dynamic agroforestry, which I already mentioned. And that supports the inclusion of high yielding biomass species, including grasses, panicum grasses, and elephant grasses. And that is largely included just to be harvested and to mulch the soil, and that's helped a lot in covering most of the soils that our farmers work on. Aside from dynamic agroforestry, I think one area we are considering is also to focus some of our fair trade projects uh, on pro uh, production practices that would help farmers intensify improving on their soils. And one of the ways is also to support the farmers have tools, the right tools to be able to do that. Because often uh, times you speak to farmers and they, they, they show interest in these practices, but how they implement 
that by themselves is very difficult. So what we do is to provide them with soft loans, interest-free, and then instead of deducting those from uh, their FFB supplies within the year, we make it flexible and then deduct over two or even three years, just so the farmers are able to implement that. And that has been working very well so far. And we expect that uh, with all the support we are getting from Dr. Bronis over the last years, Serendi Palm is fully committed to working with farmers to implementing several other regenerative practices that protect the soil, the farmer, the farmer's family, and the climate as a whole. Few challenges we've uh, had in the process of regenerative organic, uh, organic certification, and that we are currently trying to discuss that uh, with smallholder farmers and then also with our workers to see that those, those would be addressed. And it's largely around areas of living wage, and that's specifically at the farmer, farmer level, because some of them, you know, send their family members, and instead of paying them, you know, some of them just consider them as family members and not work on that. And I'm sure uh, with the implementation of the standards, those, those are areas that can easily be resolved. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Safiano. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And we're, and so we're happy to, to welcome you back for the question and answer. And thanks for giving us a really good overview of your work there in Ghana. And Garrett Long, I would like to invite up now. Garrett has come to us from Apricot or Apricot Lane Farms. And this is an incredibly diverse farm. I, I will let him and tell you all the crops that they produce and the different production schemes that they have and get into um, his knowledge about soil. He's got a wicked background in soil science and has done some really cool studies there with, um, with on site with the project and getting his master's degree on soil. So thank you, welcome Garrett. And here's thank you. Hey, good morning everybody. Um, so my name is Garrett Long. I work as a research coordinator at Apricot Lane Farms. Uh, we're a 214-acre uh, diversified, certified organic and biodynamic farm um, about two hours north of where we are today um, in Ventura County. Uh, we grow about 100 varieties of fruit and nut trees. We've got about two acres of uh, intensive year-round vegetables um, and more than 40 acres of perennial pastures, irrigated pastures. Um, historically, um, before we moved in in 2011, the farm was uh, an old historic uh, horse farm. There was some conventionally managed lemons and avocados on, on the property. Um, and since then, since 2011, for the last eight years, we've been applying these regenerative practices, these biodynamic practices since day one. Um, but we do, we do take from a variety of toolkits. Um, so, you know, we borrow principles from permaculture, from holistic management, um, from um, biodynamics, obviously, from NRCS principles of soil health, and we apply all of them together um, in order to grow these flavorful and nutrient-dense foods um, that is our goal. And I think it's important to communicate that for anybody who's on this journey or interested in this transition, that it takes time. It's taken all of eight years to really build the soil health. Um, this is not a process that we started six months ago at the kickoff of this pilot program, but rather we've been doing it for a very long time. And as a farm, you know, we're dedicated to using these practices um, that over time they reduce, you know, our goal is to reduce these outside inputs into our farm, um, to really focus on building the wildlife habitat um, and focus on biological regeneration of the soil and of the farm. Um, to that end, we've established, and this is a really great example of it, we've established 25 acres of biodiversity reserves. This is a restored pond habitat that's about an acre and a half. Um, these habitats attract beneficial insects, attract wildlife, pollinators. Um, they serve as habitat for that wildlife. Um, we've observed more than 100 different species of birds on our farm. That includes owls and hawks that help us control pre uh, pests. Um, that control the gophers and the ground squirrels, they all play an important role. And while it's hard to really maybe put a dollar sign or a value on 
these kinds of you know, native flowering plants or tree lines or hedgerows of flowers. Um, you know, I can tell you definitively that now, eight years in, we spray less than we used to. We spend less time in the field trapping gophers. And ultimately, at the end of the day, this kind of functional beauty that these biodiversity uh, habitats represent are the thing that, that really get us out of bed in the morning. We're inspired to go out and farm and inspired to work with nature in this way. Um, and, and to that end, you know, we use, we, we try to apply principles of biomimicry. Um, one of those things that we're doing is rotational grazing, rhythmically moving our cows, sheep, chickens, ducks, pigs through the pastures um, in a way that, that I'm going to leave, you know, some of our other presenters to, to discuss how that works and why we integrate animals. But I can say that as a soil scientist at a basic level, one of the reasons why we integrate animals into our farm and into our cropping systems is that just like us, animals have microorganisms, bacteria in their guts that help them process the food that they eat. And as the animals move through the pastures, what they leave behind is urine and is manure that is loaded with that diverse set of microorganisms that is specifically built to break down organic matter and break down food. And everywhere they leave those microorganisms, out in the soil environment, in the pastures, in the orchards, those microbes continue to do what they're doing in the animal guts. They're breaking down organic matter, they're mobilizing nutrients, they're releasing minerals for the plants um, and the animals that are contained there. And so ultimately, you know, <laughs> this is perfect, um, soil health is built on microbes. Well done. <laughs> Um, microorganisms are truly the, the foundation of our fertility, of our farm's immunity, of soil health is built upon that diverse and abundant set of microorganisms, of bacteria and fungi. And so there's a lot of different practices that we use at Apricot Lane to support those diverse and abundant sets of microorganisms. The first thing we do is, is not tilling. You know, we, we tucked away our plows and our discs and our rippers many years ago, and we have a focus on really building soil health and building soil structure so that when we get those big rainstorms, it actually allows that water to infiltrate and be kept where those plants need it. Um, this year we've been very blessed with a, with a winter. We've gotten more rain this year than we have in the last 20 years. As of yesterday, when it was raining, we've gotten 21 inches of rain this year. On one acre of land, one inch of rain is 27,000 gallons of water, which means that on our farm, this season alone, we've sequestered more than 122 million gallons of water that has fallen on Apricot Lane Farms. And all of that water that's not used by the cover crops and the trees and the orchards, all of that water ends up slowly trickling down to recharge the aquifer from which we're pumping from to sustain our, our operation for the other nine months of the year in our Mediterranean climate where we don't have rain. Um, we're also uh, really focused on building soil health through composting. We make more than 400 tons of compost on site um, every year, and we apply that to the, to the farm. Um, we also use some of that compost and we turn it into vermicompost. We run it through a worm bin, and then we take that vermicompost and we brew it into compost tea. Compost tea is this, is this liquid extract of compost that, allow, that is just loaded with microorganisms and like I was saying, with all those microorganisms that go out through the animal manure, those microorganisms are the key to building soil health. They ultimately become the soil organic matter that holds water, that, that is, is the source of nutrients for growing plants. And, you know, there's this idea that microorganisms uh, ultimately um, cycle nutrients in a way that... Um, that, that breaks down everything that was once alive. Organic matter is everything that was once alive, right? And if microorganisms are breaking down everything into those tiny little building blocks of life that can ultimately be taken up by plants and other microbes um, to be cycled and turned back into the diversity of life that we see on this planet, it's this great wheel of life that a lot of Eastern philosophies um, refer to. That is seriously the basis of our soil health and is the foundation of our farm and the biodiversity and everything that we're doing here. So I guess quickly in this last minute, um, some of the feedback that we have as far as piloting this program goes um, is that the administrative challenges, the hurdles of obtaining three different um, certifications is, is, uh, is cumbersome. It can be expensive. And for a farm that's already CCOF certified and Demeter certified biodynamic, 
it's a challenge to consider also seeking an animal welfare standard, a social fairness standard, and then be eligible to apply for ROC. This is, um, this is a challenge, I imagine, for other, for other small holder, holder farmers that, um, that may not have the resources to even apply for an organic certification, um, let alone the other three. And so that's an important challenge. And I think the last thing that I wanted to mention was that um, I think that this is a really important opportunity here at Expo West to really um, continue to engage in the discussion around making local processing facilities, manufacturing facilities available um, to producers. We really need to um, improve accessibility for us, for slaughterhouses, um, for co-packers, for processing facilities um, that we're not able to uh, build on our farm or vertically integrate ourselves. We have to work within the community um, to be able to um, process these regenerative foods and make them available to consumers in a way that um, will really start to move the needle on um, our food production systems. Thank you. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the frank feedback and the conversation and your work. Do you want some more? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are y'all always this charged up or is it the topic? I know. <laughs> All right, so for our next topic, we're going to get into the animal welfare pillar. And so with our animal welfare pillar, we always want to see the five freedoms are going to be emphasized. And these are pretty commonly benchmarked out there in the animal welfare standards. The freedom from discomfort, fear, distress, freedom from hunger, pain, injury and disease, and the freedom to express normal behaviors. Our animal welfare pillar also has a very strong basis in grass fed and a pasture-based system. And this is really key for our program, as well as the fact that we don't allow CAFOs. And so it presents a lot of limitations as far as kind of what, which producers we can work with. And that um, this part is, presents some challenges for sure. But um, our, our guests are going to be able to get up here and talk about this and give you some real insight into some of their successes and challenges in meeting the animal welfare standards for the rock. And so I'd like to welcome up here Miss Vanessa Alexander, who I've known for, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 years or something, when her parents first entered their dairy up in Ferndale into organic certification. And I got to see this family grow and really expand their operation and um, do all kinds of great work. So I'm really happy to introduce you to Vanessa Alexander today. And thank, thank you, you for coming. You. Yeah. Thank you to the Regenerative Organic Alliance for allowing our family to be um, in the pilot program. It's a big honor and I'm happy to be here today. So I'm Vanessa Alexander. I'm part of the fifth generation dairy uh, farming family at our, at our um, dairy up on the North Coast. We're up in Del Norte and Humboldt County, uh, just way up the street to the Oregon border. We're on the coast. Uh, I'm part of the fifth and the sixth generation is gonna be born next week. So they're coming in, it's fun. <laughs> Right now, right now we have to uh, bring in family friends to get cute photos with milk for us, so soon it'll be our own family. Um, yeah, I'm here on the uh, animal welfare section of the ROC, and I just kind of want to emphasize on build it and they will come. Uh, within the soil, within the pastures, um, within our milk and consumers. Um, so we have, we're primarily a dairy farm. We, my parents converted to organics back in the late 90s. Uh, we were traveling up to, the, to Oregon, five kids in the car, parents driving, all of us kids were sleeping at the time. And when they were traveling in Oregon, uh, a lot of those dairy farmers said, hey, you're from California, wanna buy our farm? And that was a big testament to folks then, um, saw California dairy farmers as you know, buying farms or either, or Oregon farmers going out of business. And, and that's a nationwide thing. So our par my parents wanted to create a farm that the kids can come back to. And organics was primarily um, that for us then. And, and it has because five of us kids have now gone to college and the last one is, is there a sophomore and the four oldest ones are back on the farm in different facets. So build it and they will come. My parents built the farm and the kids came. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're trying to regenerate milk uh, on our dairy through the soil, through, through everything we do. We have A2, A2 cattle, so that's the specific casein protein in the milk that makes it a little bit digestible, uh, a little bit more digestible for those that thought they couldn't do dairy. 
uh, we, we do a lot with other critters. We have chickens, we have hogs, we raise all of our dairy bull calves um, for an organic grass-fed beef program, um, just trying to add value where we can. Our, our dairy cattle were the ones in that social um, pillar photo, and they're all crossbreds um, from kind of European genetics, New Zealand genetics, uh, and, and we're trying to just add value to the cow where we can so that she can add value to the land. That land can um, uh, kind of add topsoil, build topsoil. So we have done a lot of soil testing uh, within, our, within our farms, and um, years ago we had about 1 to 3 percent of organic matter. And in 2017, my dad asked me to, October 11th, 2017, I took soil tests uh, up in Del Norte County, and those organic matters were from 8 to 14 percent, which is crazy high, which is building topsoil, which is putting carbon grass in the ground. So those, so those results came back, and my dad said, Vanessa, go back again. That can't be right. So I go back October 2018, because you have to do it at the right time, right? Same, same place, same time. And again, they were that, so it was indeed true. Um, so we're doing this through, through cattle, through chickens, through hogs, um, and through everything of the composting liquid and solid form. Uh, we add a lot of good nutrients to our compost, um, not only from the cattle, but from fisheries in Del Norte County, um, crab waste, fish waste, kind of anything, anything that comes, we're open to. And that means, you know, three truckloads of fish waste in a day. And, and the whole dairy knows because it smells a little bit. So you just cover it with compost and keep turning it. We also add all the bedding from our um, calf, rant, or calf hutches and our maternity barn. So that wood chips and wood shavings, we're adding that carbon back into our compost, composting it up, and then putting it back on the land. Um, some of the other things that we do uh, through this holistic management, these holistic management practices are building riparian areas and wetlands and um, just opening up fields and, and waters so that you know, we can build and, and fish will come and birds will come. Garrett has over 100 species of birds on his farm. We've got over 200. <laughs> so you'll get there, you'll get there. <laughs> on ebird.com, it's really neat. And it, there's over 200 species there. And there's uh, eagles, uh, an e a bald eagle's nest. Uh, and uh, the Roosevelt elk have passed the Smith River for the first time ever uh, seven years ago and made their home on our ranch. Um, over 290 elk now live full time on the dairy. Uh, it's another herd, uh, herd of cattle, but it's fun. We like to manage them. Or we like to do what we like to manage around them. <laughs> it's um, some of the joys of working within the animal welfare pillars are, um, you know, it's we always want to do the right thing at every turn with our animals, and uh, you know, it's building those standard operating procedures on how to accurately help assist in pulling a calf. That's that's animal welfare. It's it's putting a baby calf in a clean hutch. Um, that's large enough for them to move around and, you know, they have good feed and water. That's animal welfare. It's all, it's all that pillar. And this, um, in this section, it's really um, just second nature to, to do what's right for the animal um, at every turn. Uh, a little bit of the hard parts in this with the rock, because they asked to kind of talk about the joys and discomforts. Um, there's only a few... Uh, available certifications that kind of qualify up to the rock standards and some of the two out of the four of them uh, don't have dairy standards yet so for us as a large organic dairy farm that tries to do the right thing at every turn it's just it's more difficult because those standards aren't made available yet um, we have another thing is the dehorning of the cattle this is just a, a, a very hard subject because me, as a dairy farmer that grew up right across the street from the dairy cattle, I'm never scared of cows. They're just sec second nature. We, we work really well together. In 2017, we tested um, as a kind of trial run for a Demeter certification of our dairy farm. So we raised about 1,500 heifers and steers with cattle horns on them. And uh, so in 2018, we got to see that, how that panned out with 1,500 horned animals on the farm. And it was just very, very difficult. Um, it, it really made 
uh, the animal more aggressive, and it also made me more scared of that animal, and that's not our intent, right? Um, it also, uh, at some points, kind of those horns get knocked up. You know, when those cattle are um, rubbing up against all the trees that we put up, uh, that's not good for the tree, and it's not good for that horn, because it could break off, it could bleed. It's, it's just not, it's not the best thing. Um, so that's, that's a struggle, and it's something that I, I certainly would love to talk more about um, with, with the framework founders, um, but it's, it's a major one for us. Um, and, and we're always welcome to visitors. We're always welcome to uh, questions because we want to be transparent in everything we do. So certainly if you have further questions on it, let us know. But we are happy to be a part of the pilot program and, and happy to be here. Um, thank you. We're happy you're here too. Thank you, Vanessa. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. Great. Great. <laughs> Excuse me. It seems like we have a little competition going on here. And if the next person I'm going to introduce is going to give you a run for your money, I suspect. We've got Mr. Marshall Johnson, who's representing the Audubon Ranches Conservation Ranching, Audubon Bird Society's Conservation Ranching Program which I had the great opportunity to go learn about when I went to Santa Fe and met with a, a group of these rangeland ecologists and scientists and ranchers and all these folks who've been working on the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program. Really neat to have them as partners in this program and he's got a lot of wisdom to share about cattle ranching up in the Dakotas and I'm really pleased to announce and introduce you to Marshall Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Jared and Vanessa, I was supposed to be the bird guy. <laughs> Come on. Um, I'm really uh, uh, happy to be with you all. Um, in truth, I'm really happy to be anywhere that's not negative 20 right now, uh, like it is back home in Fargo. And I'm particularly happy to be here uh, given the subject and the content that we're going over and we're talking about relative to regenerative organic certification. Um, too often as a wildlife conservation professional, I attend, I talk to wildlife conservation prof professionals at wildlife conservation conferences, and we don't talk about food. And um, <coughs> I come to a lot of food con conferences, and I'll tell you that we don't talk about biodiversity enough. We don't talk about wildlife enough. We don't talk about habitat enough. So my charge to you today, if you remember anything, is that it all matters. Whatever happens out on the land, it all matters. You know, I, I must be a, a glutton for punishment because uh, as, as Elizabeth uh, referenced, Audubon has launched our conservation ranching program, which is a market-based certification program focused on biodiversity in grassland. And we are happy to say that at this point, we've enrolled 60 ranches across nearly 2 million acres in the Midwest. And we're really <laughs> excited about that. Um, in terms of how do you get in, implement a program such as the regenerative organic certification, I think when it comes to animal welfare, and it's something that I am particularly uh, uh, happy and, and engaged in and concerned about, um, I think it's really important, and that's Dan Rasmussen, myself, and Sarah Hewitt, our conservation programs uh, manager out on the land with the owner and operator of the 33 Ranch, which is uh, the ranch that we're working to um, facilitate their pilot um, with the regenerative organic certification. And uh, to some of the early successes that we've had, I think are related to three main components. Number one, the regenerative organic uh, certification allows for leveraging other certifications and other programs. So we can bring the what assets we have with the conservation ranching program to bear in supporting implementation of the regenerative organic uh, standard. Dan is, uh, we selected Dan because Dan is so passionate about the topic that we're, we're discussing here today, and that is animal welfare. Um, getting back to what I mentioned earlier, it matters. I remember when we were launching our conservation ranching program, a rancher uh, in a room much like this stood up and said, we're all about the birds. We want to uh, do what's right for the birds, but 
and you want to do what's right for the birds, so why do you have the animal welfare component? It matters. It matters how we treat the livestock, it matters how we treat and steward the water um, and the resource. And so I think uh, having that ability to leverage the uh, uh, conservation ranching program with the ROC standard is really important. Uh, number two, and I, I, this is an encouragement as we move forward through the pilot with the regenerative organic, organic certification, is we got to have boots on the ground. We got to have people that are working with hand in hand the producers to facilitate um, what is for many of them a sea change. I think I'm, I represent the National Audubon Society. We've been around for 120 years. I work with about 20 ranches that have been around a lot longer, by decades. And so we want to bring that expertise. We want to bring that, that um, knowledge to bear uh, in, in creating this sea change. But we want to be mindful of the success that's brought these ranches to where they, they are today. And I know having those boots on the ground, you know, the names Lucy Love, Josh Leffers, um, Cody Gruen probably mean nothing to you, but they mean everything to me. And they mean everything to the relationship that we have between our ranchers and the program that we are facilitating their entry into. Um, so I would really encourage, um, in terms of animal welfare, um, it's particularly important because certification programs, programs like uh, Regenerative Organic Certification, our Audubon's Conservation Ranching Program for families that have been on the land and having success for four and five generations, they're intrusive. They have to be intrusive because we need transparency. We need, have to make sure that what we say, whether it's the Audubon uh, uh, certification or regenerative organic or the story that they tell together, it has to mean something. Um, so having those boots on the ground, those people that can help, um, it's not a, you know, here's the certification, you know, figure it out. Having those boots on the ground uh, have always been very important for us as we're um, facilitating this program. Um, and lastly, you know, the family. Uh, the 33 Ranch, uh, Dan Rasmussen, his wife Dawn, um, uh, Amy and Blake, uh, they're his uh, sister and uh, her husband, and uh, Dan and, and Dawn's daughter Kate, who is now taking over the operation. Um, and this is a great time to be uh, working on regenerative organic. Uh, they, they have a focus on uh, using animal husbandry and animal welfare as a means to change um, how they do their, their operation, um, how they work out on the landscape. Because uh, have, decreasing the stress to the animal is a big part of just decreasing the stress for the families and improving the way of life for ranchers. Um, and I think that's lost sometimes where uh, focusing on animal welfare is some, sometimes considered doing so at the um, uh, uh, kind of substituting for lifestyle. They go really one and the same. Uh, some of the challenges that I would leave you with today um, in terms of the regenerative organic program that I think this pilot is going to be really helpful in working through in the Midwest, in a number of states, it's essentially illegal not to brand your cattle. We obviously know that, that there's sensitivity and that's a, that's a big issue where we have to have stakeholders in the room to tackle. Um, how do we work through that? That's what we're, those are some of the questions that we're answering now. Um, I, I would, one of the elements that I love and, and Elizabeth showed it uh, a moment ago, uh, I call it the Bill of Rights for Cattle, the Cattle Bill of Rights, the freedom. Um, I think it's really important and what's really talking about and addressing is decreasing the stress to the animal. And that's really, whether it's for access to water, access to pasture, what you're really talking about is decreasing the stress to the animal. Uh, and I think that uh, our pilot in Western South Dakota, you know, the Badlands, uh, Dan Rasmussen's, Rasmussen's dad uh, likes to tell a joke. He grew up in three inches from the grass, uh, from the Badlands. Um, which meant to him, if you scratch the surface three inches, you get soil, and beneath that is 15 feet of bad lands. So there were, it's a harsh uh, uh, landscape where you have uh, negative 20 degree temperatures for months at a time. So um, I think it's really important that we use animal welfare as a means to 
uh, change operations, improve operations, and I'm so glad to be working with Elizabeth and her team to do just that on the 33 Ranch and other ranches. So thank you. Thank you. I can't wait to come and visit y'all. It's gonna be amazing. Here, I brought you some water. Yeah, thanks. Conveniently enough, those folks at 33 Ranch are located really close to another amazing operation that I think we'll be bringing into the Rock program that you all may have heard of called Wild Idea. And uh, that's a really large ranch uh, running bison out there in the West. And, um, and well, we call it the Dakotas. So yeah, thank you for coming and taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm gonna move on to the next pillar here. We're gonna look at the social fairness pillar. And this one has been and will continue to be particularly challenging for us to implement because of just the differences between the developing and developed world or global south and global north and we're really running into a lot of this right now as we kind of get deeper into our pilot project and so we expect a lot of learnings to come out of the next few months and I am just really happy to, um, to be able to share the people here today with you, our representatives for for this, um, for this pillar. So we have one who's coming and representing, they're quite an exception, I think, for, um, for farms here in the United States in how they have approached this and the research and work that they've done. And so I'm gonna let Matt Dybala from the Herb Farm invite him up to the stage to come and talk to us more about the work they're doing. And if you would please join me up here, Matt, and I'm gonna, oh yes. These good ladies, these good women right here reminding me, people, please ask us questions. We'd love your questions, so get, throw them at us. Give us hard questions. Point at anything that you see, areas that we really need to work on or think about. Give us your questions, please. And um, after, as we conclude these sessions, and we're going to gather those up, and anything that we don't have time to answer during our Q&A, we're going to send out to you in that newsletter. So we really want your feedback. This is about transparency and getting that information so we can make the standard something that really works in the real world. So thank you, and please welcome to Matt. Thanks for thank coming. You. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, hi everyone, thank you. We're just gonna continue right down the line of diversity of, of ideas behind the ROC and just the diversity of panelists, just how many different crops we're growing and how much all-encompassing this, this is. So uh, really quickly, I'll just say that I've been um, working with a company now for 13 years. We, I manage 256 acres of herbs and um, we grow about 80 different species. And I think I came to the regenerative ag certification as a farmer, so I loved the soil component and the ag component. Um, but I'm up here speaking about the social component, so I thought uh, we all asked to bring pictures of our farm. I'd love to sit up here and talk about our farm. I'm going to sneak in probably a few things about soil because I just can't stay away. But I, did, I do want to uh, highlight the, the human aspect of this uh, program because it's, a, it's like Elizabeth said, it's a very challenging aspect, but it's also a very vital part of ROC. In fact, I think it might be the most unique and um, kind of set apart component to this whole certification. So I'm just starting with this photo here of a group of folks. Uh, and you can see here, uh, what, I, I know a lot of these folks in this photo. So as I look up on this photograph, I can see uh, uh, pioneers in the natural health industry and future naturopaths and future teachers and I think across the board just all excellent organic gardeners and um, since I know two of the folks in the in the photograph that uh, started the company I worked for 40 years ago um, I can say that I think there's a little bit of unrecognized wisdom in this photo um, and by that I mean um, the idea that uh, you know, wisdom is different than knowledge that we mostly hold in our, in our minds and in our head and we share as ideas. Wisdom is something that evokes kind of thinking beyond ourselves. And uh, to me, that really means at the end of the day, it's nothing mystical there. It just means that we, we are really paying attention on how to attend for things outside for other life forms. And so that's paying attention to the life in our soil, the macro life on our farm, like all the other farmers have talked about, the micro life on our farms. And how do, we, how do we enhance those? So um, again, that's, that's really a part of this. And, and I think one of the uh, successes and challenges of regenerative ag is that, that, going back to that photo, is that there needs to be 
a foundation uh, built into your business or your company or your farm for the social pillar to be successful it extends beyond the farm it goes to your CEOs to your human resources department to uh, your employee handbooks and to your mission statement so there is the possibility that um, some some of the ROA uh, and the ROC program can be sometimes misconstrued as strictly an agricultural based certification so this is why it's very important to not only learn uh, the standards that have to do with soil and animal welfare, but the, but the social fairness component. So you have to really read closely through those, okay? And uh, the social fairness component has some, at, at, the, at the basic line of it, it's about living wages. It's, uh, it's also about uh, creating relief for farmers under natural disasters, okay? And, um, and all these, uh, and just basically enhancing your, the, the employees that you bring onto your farm. So um, I do want to, uh, well, these big pictures are going quickly, but um, uh, again, I do want to um, mention that I think there's a lot of, that last photo there, I wanted to make the, the sense that we see a lot of pictures of, of plants and farms and um, I just want to talk about this as, as something that's kind of trendy right now. To me, this is, this is one of our fields. And you're going to see a lot of this imagery as you walk around through Expo and around brands. And to me, this is, this is like fake news of farming. And, and so to me, there's a lot of missing things. There's, you can't see the microbial action in the soil. Um, you can't see the carbon that's built, being built up in the soil. Um, the, and, and most of all, you can't see the people here in this picture. Okay, and this is all about transparency. And this is what the R ROC is really bringing to the table, is transparency. All these components are part of the standards. So it, again, this is a very difficult task, but uh, this is inherent in all those parts. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, in the, in the uh, social component, uh, you're going to find a, a lot of the... Um, some very challenging aspects of, um, again, the living wage component that some of the uh, other farmers have talked about. Um, there's also uh, a lot of the uh, hours of work has to be kept within a certain amount of time. If you have family members on your farm, like some of you do, uh, you really have to look at that part of it well and see if that'll work for your, for your farm as well. A lot of farms are family farms, and there are rules around that. Um, housing for if you have housing on your farm, there's some really high standards for all these. Um, and uh, so again, um, this, really, uh, this really sets apart, I think the social pillar is actually the one thing that sets apart this certification from all the farm-based certifications, hands down. Um, it certainly does, so, and, and it needs to be there, so. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, really. Um, you, know, why, uh, you know, why do we need this type of uh, transparency now in organic farming? Um, I've been in agriculture and horticulture for 20 years, and uh, I teach a lot of classes, mostly farm-based classes. And um, there's two things that I've been having to tell young farmers and, and people that are just getting into agriculture over and over again, uh, that our culture and our modern economy really does place more value on, on products and not on raw materials and the producers that work hard to produce them. And that needs to change. And the, just the fact alone that there hasn't been a social component in all these organic certi type certifications, it's, it's the elephant in the room actually that's sitting here amongst us all that we can change today with, with this program. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a really important part of this program. Okay. And um, I think I think this I can kind of bring it home with this with this uh, image here. This is a uh, besides having uh, over two dozen employees that are employed on our farm. My favorite part of getting work done on the farm is our 10-week internship program we've had since the very beginning. Over the last 30 years, we we have a 10-week program, and this brings in uh, employees uh, and uh, and herbalists and farmers uh, together. It creates this instant community of uh, of, of shared values and uh, folks that really want to change the world. And these are folks that uh, I call, you know, how do we promote earth stewardship in a better way? 
you know, how do we promote that in an equitable way? Because right now there aren't a lot of opportunities, and if they are, they're not equal, and, and the pay is, is, is not equal as well for all these other industries. Really quickly before I end, um, I just want to get a show of hands in this room. Who in this room uh, has the word farm or farmer in, the, in their job title? Huh. Nice one. Okay. So uh, maybe 10 people out of, out of a, few, a few hundred, so, or 150. So again, uh, kudos to you. But at the end of the day, um, this, this is about supporting farmers. Um, this social pillar is about, uh, is about the consumer. It's about uh, the companies that support farms. And you're the ones that are really going to make this happen. I hope I can come back here in five to 10 years and, and be part of the ROC and uh, have a lot more people raise their hands because right now we need to, we need to bring uh, a, a level of fairness and the social component's gonna do that for us through the ROC. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for sharing. You want some water? That was really powerful. Thank you, Matt, for sharing those insights. And, uh, and I agree, I mean, that social pillar, it really helps us stand out and one area where we don't have as hard of a time addressing that social pillar is in the developing world or in the global south. There's a lot of different certifications out there available and we have a number of our pilot participants who are carrying different certifications for the social justice component. And I'm really, really proud to introduce to you today one of our pilot participants from Nicaragua. It's a, play, a country, a really amazing country that has gone through all kinds of struggles and most, most of all recently. And so I'm just really proud to have Gabriela Zapata from Soul Simple Farms join us all the way from Nicaragua and share some of her insights. So thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Um, hi everyone, uh, firstly I want to introduce me, I'm Gabriela Zapata and I come from Nicaragua. I don't know if you know where it is, but it's in Central America and it's next to Costa Rica, just for some information. So <laughs> I'll be part of the team of Soul Simple and Soul Simple is an amazing company because we work with a smallholder directly. Right now we have more than a thousand smallholders. So all these farmers depend on Soul Simple. They produce some fruits like mangoes, pitaya or dragon fruit, banana, um, passion fruit, we have cashew too. And we have a lot of uh, new fruit to, to, to make in this, in this market. So Actually, I, I want to start my, my participation speaking more um, a little bit about Nicaragua. Nicaragua is the second poor country in Latin America. And we have a lot of problems with corruption and water. So it's a difficult because we need to try to, to improve the life of all these smallholders. So, about the social fairness, we have uh, really an amazing successful because the company work with transparency. We associate all the smallholder in collection center because they have a lot of fear uh, to trust in cooperative. So we need to we need to work individually with them. And right now we have 15 collection center with this old with this more of the thousand smallholder. So I think it's a great, uh, a great successful because they trust in us. They trust to sell all the fruit with us and they are working in organic and fair trade in with, in with fair trade certification. So I think we have this uh, amazing successful. And I want to say that Nicaragua, Nicaraguan people are are in innovating because um, they are trying to use regenerative practice. Just is not just for marketing or for to take more uh, advantage. It's more to survive because they have less than the other in other country. So they need to preserve all the soil, all the animals, and they need to preserve the farm for the new generation, for their kids. 
So, uh, firstly, they don't make uh, they don't make till practices. Firstly, because they don't have truck. Actually, <laughs> yes. Actually, they have uh, they have uh, uh, a small farm, like Fausto Calero. This is one of the farmer. We know all our farmer by each name. So. They have like uh, in average one hectare. This is around two acres. So they 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 have this area for the house and for the plantation. So they need to to put plantation maybe in some ca in some cases are uh, fruit because they can sell the fruit and they can make some money. So the company is very committed to try to improve the, the income of this farmer. How can we do that? Well, actually, we make uh, the payment very transparency because they receive a code and in, in every deliver they receive um, a receive <laughs> um, and they know what they want and why they, what they have in payment. In the, set, in the moment, and we create an account and a bank account, and each farmer have her own account in the bank, so they receive the payment in the moment. So, by other by other side, we work with this collection center just to, and they decide they they took two leader by each collection center to try to negotiate the prices annually with us, and we try to, um, to take the, the voice of the old farmer to try to know what, it, what they need and what we can do for, him, for them. So actually, um, I am the main agronomist and the group of the, of the field team. Um, we are uh, 16 agronomists in the, in the field team. And we have more than 1,000 farmers, so it's a lot of time in the field with a lot of smallholders. But we love the, our job. So um, we, made, we, we made some trainees for the farmer, and right now we are, we are working to try to make the contract. Last year, we, we signed the first contract. So the company have eight years working with them, and last year was the first year um, signed contract with all these smallholders. So I think it's an other successful uh, that we have. And this year we, we want to improve more in this, and we want to improve with financial uh, program because they don't have access to to the financing in any bank because they are very small. But with us, they, are, they have a financial for the input. And we have like four years ago working with this. And I think the company have, um, is a very good option for this small holder. And I think we need, to, we need to think more about how can we do to preserve our planet. How can we do to improve the, the lifestyle of our smallholder? So right now, I think so simple have an incredible, an incredible team, and we are working together to try to improve the life of all these Nicaraguan people. So remember that when you are consuming some product of the small country or poor country, is a very hard working behind. So thank you to, to before, be part of this. Before she concludes, I, we had a conversation at dinner last night, and I would just love you to share the struggles of getting your, heart, your mangoes. Yes, it, uh, ask them. To move them, if you could please just um, share for a minute what we were talking about last night of moving the trucks of fruit and the road blockages. Oh, the yes. roadblocks in Nicaragua right now. We all like thank you for the extra time. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sorry, Nancy. <laughs> yeah, last year we have a very critical political situation in my country. So uh, all the all the road was blocked, and we are in the seasoning. So all the smallholders say, "Oh, I don't know what happened with the harvest, but we need to be." We need the deliver of the fruit because they depend only of that fruit. So if the company 
go to the to the to the to the country that people uh, have a very difficult situation because the local market don't have the capacity to consume all that fruit. So we worked hard, very hard, <laughs> the last year because uh, we purchase all fruit. We need to go to negotiate with these people in the road to try to, to convince them to pass the truck with the, all the fruit of this small holder. So, and you have to pay to pass. <laughs> yeah, and we need so to, pay to pay to pass, pass the and truck. Come home. So, yes, <laughs> every day we need to go to negotiate. But the most important about this situation is the small holder feels very trust in us. They feel that we are working together, and this is a win-to-win -win, um, operation. If you have, uh, if you are convinced, all these as a smallholder, um, you can see amazing change in that life. So thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. You were wonderful. That was so good. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Gabriella. All right, well, for our next panelist or guest up here on the stage, I'd like to invite Nova Sayer. And she's, going to, she's worked with NSF and she's helped us from the beginning to implement this and, and probably many of you who are in our pilot are quite familiar with Nova, with her work in this world. And I wanna just invite you to come up, Nova, and, and I'll just stay up here with you if you wanna talk about the journey to regenerative and all the work that you all have done to help make this program successful. Thank you, Nova. Thank you. Nova and her team of people who are here. Thank you. Hi. I think I have to use this mic. Um, and I just want to ask you to bear with me. I've got a bit of a husky voice. Um, we all do a lot of talking at Expo. Uh, but this might be one of the subjects that I'm the most inspired and enthusiastic to talk about. Um, it's great to be back here after launching this program one year ago at Expo and be able to share with you all of the work that's been done and all of the work that we need to do moving forward and that we'd like to do with you in partnership. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I work for NSF International and just for those of you who don't know us, it's a not-for-profit uh, organization that's dedicated to protecting public health and the health of the environment. So this work in regenerative organic is perfectly aligned with that mission and it's part of the reason that I joined that organization. I personally was awoken to the possibility and the powerful opportunity to heal this planet and heal our culture through regenerative agriculture several years ago and I realized this needed to be my life's work and I'm so honored to be able to work on it with all of my colleagues at NSF and I met the founders of the ROA several years ago out in the regenerative community and I heard about the powerful vision that you all wanted to bring to this marketplace. It's a market-based solution. Um, and we got together and we talked about the expertise that NSF could bring to this because we work in climate. We work across agriculture, textiles, fiber. Um, we work on standards development and certification. So we decided to partner together. And I want to explain to you what NSF's role is, what we have done, and what we need to do going forward. So this roadmap here, how you can be a part of that, um, and what we hope to achieve at the end of the rainbow. So um, first off, let me mention NSF's technical role is as the scheme manager and oversight body. What does that mean? <laughs> um, bringing a new standard and certification program to the marketplace is incredibly complex and no organization can do it alone. It has to be done through partnerships and you need global reach. This standard has an incredibly high bar and aspiration, not in one but in three impact areas. Um, so we act as the technical and management partner. That means we create audit procedures, we train and approve certifiers, we build participant tools and guidance. Hopefully everyone has received the handbook, it's all on the website. And behind the scenes we create management systems to support the success of this program. So we've already been through public comment, thanks to all of the comments that many of you in this room made. We've adapted the standard. 
We're now at the critical point of conducting these pilots. The pilots are a learning opportunity. We fully expect that by auditing farms all around the world that are producing a diverse range of materials, changes will be made, will make the standard better. And we aim to open for business, so to speak, for open applications. Anyone here on the Expo 4 could uh, sign up to be part of the ROC community uh, by fall of this year. But behind the scenes, we'll be doing what I think might be the most important work of all, and that's building a system to map a registry system to map all of the farms, brands, products, and materials that are in the ROC community and share that with the world, but also collect data about those operations. We want to collect impact data, impact on soil health, impact on the lives of farmers and farm workers, impact on animals, and we want to be able to communicate that impact. When we do that, we're going to catalyze so many more to join us and we'll be able together to build this regenerative marketplace and empower consumers to work on that with us. So I'm really looking forward to those next steps. Yeah, it's going to be key. Thank you. Thank you. The NSF has been a fantastic partner for us. Um, I think so. I think we're going to move to the movie. Thank you. Yeah, NSF has um, a great team of people, and they have just been working so hard on getting all these tools in place. It's been really fantastic to work with them. and. Now I want to just share who the Regenerative Organic Alliance is because these are the heroes and sheroes I get to report to all the time and it um, gives me just great, great thrill and honor. Um, ooh, it looks like a battery warning. Oh. Um, yeah, so this is our board and some of them are here in the room, quite a few in fact. We've got Dana Geffner, Rose Macario, David Bronner, David Vedder, Jeff Moyer. And so um, I'm really proud to have you all here and to be able to, to do this work with you. And, and really what we're doing now is, is as Nova described, we're gonna jump into these pilots and over the next few months, take the learnings back and be, this, this board's gonna be working really hard in the next few months as we really kind of drill down and make sure the standard is ready for public and ready to move forward. And so, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really looking forward to this and, and um, us becoming a resource for this industry and getting to the place where we can see these, these out on the marketplace. So we're gonna start to see these logos. The bronze is showing a commitment to rock. It's not something that's gonna be used on, on pack. Um, certified organic is still required. It's introducing, introducing the regenerative organic practices and moving people along that continuous improvement concept. Um, the silver is something you'll probably see a lot more of as, as we start to get participants in the pilot process and future applicants approved for ROC. And so um, this will demonstrate a successful adoption of the key regenerative practices and, and they will be able to use the seal on pack. And it's, of course the gold is going to be really high bar and it's a successful adoption of key regenerative practices across all pillars. And we might not see that quite as frequently, that's a real North Star achievement. So when you see an, a gold rock seal out there, you know you're getting something really good. And I am to move along here. I just wanna say like that we all recognize, like, it's been the conversation all week, the whole climate day, like we're in a crisis and we need a diversity of solutions and stakeholders to address this crisis. And we feel like this rock framework is exactly that. And we want to try and bring change to the world of agriculture and really implement these practices and think that the earth is not a commodity. We have the privilege of stewardship. We need to think of the earth as our host and behave like gracious guests on this earth. And, and also thinking about ways that we communicate this message out to the world, the storytelling that we want to do around this. And so this is a really incredible opportunity and we have a very special treat for you today and I get to introduce Sandra Keats. She's the producer of this film you're gonna see, start seeing everywhere. It's called The Biggest Little Farm. Don't miss it, you're gonna get to see a little trailer here and it is about Apricot Lane Farms that uh, Garrett spoke so eloquently about earlier. And so I'd like to introduce you up here, Sandra. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Yep, there you go. Um, so, Apricot Lane Farms is really unique because it was started uh, by a filmmaker 
uh, John Chester and his wife Molly, who was actually trying to quit the film business to start farming and ultimately made a film about it. So, um, but he actually did sell all of his equipment, um, but saved one camera and was convinced somewhat begrudgingly to start documenting the process uh, in the beginning of the farm. And um, he continued that process with the help of some very talented and passionate woofers who volunteers on the farm. And um, they continue to film. And that has now turned into a feature length documentary film that follows the journey of John and Molly as they are transforming a once um, now depleted, con completely dead lemon and avocado farm into a uh, regenerative bastion of biodiversity. Um, so it, it's, for us, we just feel it's a really unique opportunity to be able to show people what we're talking about, <laughs> what regenerative farming is, what it looks like, um, why it's important, and, um, and be able to uh, have people value it um, in, a, in a way, expose them to it, tell the story of this, and um, beyond just understanding what it means, it's really falling in love with it. Um, we feel that once people start to fall in love with it, um, they'll change their buying habits. And uh, that's what we hope this film will do, help people fall in love with it. We hope that everyone will use it, be able to use it as a tool to help explain what this really means. Comes out in theaters in May, uh, nationwide, and then spreads uh, worldwide starting in the summer. And um, we hope you'll check it out and spread the word. Nice, thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing with us.